very uh, good afternoon to all the distinguished uh, dignitaries and uh, the panelists uh, and our participants uh, who have gathered uh, for this online training program. And I welcome you all to a third and last day of this three-day online training program on <clears throat> the Astra Management for Power Sector uh, that is organized by Nation Institute of the Astra Management, Ministry of Home Affairs in collaboration with uh, Delhi Transco Limited, New Delhi. And uh, before we proceed for the third and last day of uh, this training programs, uh, I will be providing a brief of uh, second day. On the second day of, <coughs> of training program, we have three presentations that were delivered by uh, Dr. Y.P. Chamla, who, who is former advisor to Government of India on uh, power regulatory matters, uh, as well as uh, he is senior research fellow, International Institute of Information and Technology. Second uh, talk was uh, by Mr. Rajiv Parwar, who uh, is uh, chief general manager at Power System Corporation, Operation Corporation Limited, and the third uh, was taken by myself. And the topics that were discussed yesterday were related to um, we have an overview of uh, power sectors, uh, the challenges uh, power sectors face, a purpose of the resilience for to uh, various disasters. And in second talk, Mr. Parval uh, shared his experience and expertise uh, with us on the issues uh, related to power uh, system due to um, various hazards. And, uh, for example, he also talked about uh, cyclones, he uh, talked about uh, extreme events, floods, landslides, and also he provided insights on uh, preparation strategies for uh, prevention and mitigations of uh, disaster risk at power sectors. And in the end, uh, we had a discussion on the template of a disaster management plan. So uh, today, uh, today uh, there will be a technical session, which will be followed by validation session, as this is the last day of this CT on a training program. And in today in technical session, uh, there will be uh, two talks uh, from the, our experts, and they will be covering uh, topics like uh, planning for resilient uh, resilience of uh, power uh, sector, as well as one talk will be on early warning and, and early warning system and communications. So, uh, for first talk, we have with us uh, Mr. Hari Kum Hari Hara Kumar, uh, who is young professional in uh, GMR Design of NITM, and he is an engineer as well as urban planner by heart and having experience in disaster management. And uh, Mr. Uh, Hari has worked. Uh, closely and in coordination with various organizations and in particular uh, government uh, deployment agencies for disaster risk reduction and resilience projects. And uh, before, uh, prior to this uh, joining an idea, he has worked with Gujarat State Disaster Management Authority as a sector manager. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hari has a graduation in civil uh, engineering and postgraduate in urban and regional planning. And today, uh, Mr. Hari will be uh, talking about, he will be discussing about uh, the planning, uh, planning for uh, resilience of power sector. But before I pass on the stage to Mr. Hari, I request participants for their active participation uh, in the technical session. Uh, you can share your uh, queries either through chat box or uh, through, a Q you can also use uh, QA and box uh, for your queries. So with this words, uh, the floor is your Mr. Hari. Thank you, Mr. Anil. You please pass me the present. Okay. Give me a second. Let me share my presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anil. Uh, could you please confirm whether my screen is visible? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to all. And uh, First of all, I would like to convey my uh, special, like I'm very grateful to Professor Surya Prakash, uh, head GMRD, and uh, Dr. Uh, Sri Taj Hassan, IPS, Executive Director of NADM, for giving me this opportunity to share my views on this platform. And uh, as all we know that, like electricity, like our uh, basic necessities, like roads and mobiles, has become a necessity over time. Like while urban areas almost come to a halt in its absence, rural areas to feel an acute impact on lives and livelihoods. So the important infrastructure sector is frequently impacted by disasters caused by uh, majorly, you can say, cyclones, floods. So if you see, uh, while the power sector is highly vulnerable to natural hazards, power supply is one of the lifelines for post-disaster relief and recovery. Uh, for example, if I say, 
Odisha, like a coastal state in Eastern India, provides an interesting example of how our infrastructure needs to be made resilient to minimize uh, disaster impacts on people. So earlier, uh, before uh, the cyclone, uh, the state of Odisha is highly prone to severe cyclones. So uh, they face like uh, the uh, 1990 severe uh, cyclone, which is which caused huge devastation in the uh, state of Odisha. And later, after uh, 14 years, it was again hit by cyclone Pailin, which is also uh, resulted in uh, less risk. But there is an impact on infrastructure at the time. But uh, what happened is that state has undertaken significant work over the years to protect the lives of its citizens. So this includes uh, working on uh, development of infrastructure like multi-purpose cyclone shelters in coastal areas, using state and federal funds, and training and capacity building of first responders and awareness generation at the local level. And the impact of these steps can be seen uh, like uh, in the sharp decline in the minimum uh, in the in the number of deaths like if you see uh, in the 1999 super cyclone more than 10000 lives were lost but in the year of 2019 cyclone funny the maximum wind speeds were over 200 km per hour less than 100 lives were lost however uh, the investments made uh, in rural electrification over the last few years were wiped out to a large extent in many areas but learning from uh, earlier experience for the power sector the state energy department and act city company started mobilizing disaster preparedness action actions as soon as uh, the early warning for the cyclone was received by and uh, sops was put into operation this include uh, pre positioning of uh, teams in the area on the predicted cyclone path allowing a inventory from uh, other screens to be used for restoration and delegation of financial powers to field level engineers so this kind of activities uh, they carried out in the uh, like in implementation of their SOPs and then in their actions showed a very huge impact on the uh, losses of this kind of uh, cyclones and other incidents. So uh, like this, uh, today I'm going to discuss like a few aspects related to where we focus and which aspects to be considered for make uh, to make our power sector a kind of resilient system which can be uh, easily come back to life after, uh, which is, uh, we all know that we can't uh, prevent hazards. But if you focus on the activities and mitigation activities, the loss can be minimized. So uh, like this in the power sector also, if you adopt few resilient processes and a few implementations, which can lead to uh, minimize the risk in the power sector also. So, uh, so if you see, uh, India's per capita electricity consumption, like in the year of 20, uh, 2012 and 13, we have around uh, 914 kilowatt per hour. But the uh, per capita uh, consumption has been increased to 1 kg, uh, like 1208 kilowatt hours. And we have a very uh, like uh, limited channels, like uh, hydro electricity, the nuclear, and then uh, thermal power plants. and renewable energy like so wind power and then solar panels are there but the first question is uh what kind of uh power sector we need what kind of power consumption we need so the answer is simple like uh for the name uh, for uh, for telling it will be simple but achieving is like very difficult if you see the provision of uh reliable secure and affordable access is like essential to power economic growth and development so the power system is at risk from array of natural, technological, and man-made threats that can cause everything from the power interruption to chronic undersupply. So it is critical for uh, policy makers, planners, and system operators to safeguard the system and plan for invest in the improved resilience for the power sector in their countries and then uh, in the states also. So, but if you adopt a holistic uh, resilience planning actors can anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to the threats and stresses on the power system, we can achieve the resilience in power sector. So uh, in uh, resilience planning, we have to identify the threats, impacts, vulnerabilities to the power system and devices or strategies to mitigate the what are the threats we identified. And uh, the power sector resilience is totally focusing on to anticipate, 
prepare for and adapt to changing condition and withstand respond to and recover rapidly from disruption to the power sector through adaptable and holistic planning and technical solution so uh, this is like overall aim how we, uh, what kind of resilient system we need in power sector so uh, at the same time what are the threats to our uh, system like natural threats uh, like uh, the threats to the power system can be uh, classified into three types natural hazards natural hazards technical hazard and human caused hazards so these hazards can uh, impact the transmission phase or distribution phase or in the generation phase in the power system so we will discuss like what kind of hazards are there like what will be the impact on that so if you talk about natural hazards so natural hazards include long term climatic changes such as variations in precipitation patterns and changes in air and water temperatures as well as severe weather events such as storms uh, flooding and storm surges if you see for example warm water and drought may impact the availability of cooling water for thermal generation and increase competition between uh, hydroelectric generation facilities and other users at the same time altered precipitation patterns and more intense storms can impact hydropower output and biomass uh, resource availability so at the same time if you see uh, changes in wind direction speed and availability can alter wind power generation and damage transmission and distribution line so uh, flooding and extreme weather events such as hurricanes cyclones severe storms and wildfires can damage generation transmission and distribution of infrastructure so all uh, these uh, natural hazards this kind of naturally uh, natural threats includes in our society related to uh, power sector and these hazards are really uh, wide in nature and then location specific at the same time, if you talk about technological, uh, technological hazards, technological are often uh, unpredicted uh, equipment and infrastructure failures. For example, uh, dam failures, nuclear power station accidents, generation station uh, fires, and power outages caused by fact, uh, like mm -hmm. faulty systems equipment, or aging infrastructure, all are considered to be uh, technological hazards. These hazards can be stand alone or tied to human caused or natural threats. For example, uh, for example, if I say uh, one of the accident happened in uh, not in India, but uh, the Three Mile Island nuclear incident was an isolated technology failure, whereas the Fukushi, uh, Fukushima nuclear incident was directly tied a uh, 15 meter tsunami caused by Great uh, East Japan earthquake of 5.6 magnitude. So this kind of threats, like this, is a kind of combined. So when uh, natural hazard natural hazards and technology are combined it will create a huge risk which creates a devastating impact on the uh, society and the system also at the same time we have uh, human caused hazards human caused hazards are uh, basically into two categories you can say accidents are bad actors so accidents and malicious uh, malicious events so accidents involve unintentional actions that damage systems, such as a driver running into a transmission pole and causing an outage. And if you see uh, malicious uh, events are the result of deliberate, harmful and human actions, such as physical terrorism or cyber attacks or on foreign infrastructure and control system. Or if you can say uh, physical attacks could injure workers and destroy energy infrastructure and uh, uh, like such as fuel pipelines or transmission lines and cyber attacks can impact uh, system operations or take. So these are uh, some of the human caused hazards. So uh, if you see a uh, disaster comes with very, very wide nature of features, like you can't predict the disaster and it has uh, uncertainty and that will be very high and it create a sense of urgency and then speed. It comes in here like very rapid speed and then there are certain times where we can't familiarize the system also that kind of situation also uh, we can uh, anticipate in in time uh, situation of a disaster so what uh, like what kind of uh, impact uh, can create uh, in power sector by disaster is like if you see uh, basically power sector that uh, major components will be like resources transport generation transmission distribution and end customers so uh, if you see 
disaster can impact from resources to customer at any level. So if you see, for example, uh, like in detail, if you see, uh, it can impact in resources like disruption of supply due to hazard impacts and transport, disruption of transport networks, generation, and transmission and distribution, like during the supply, disruption to supplies and reduced efficiency due to extreme temperatures, very high winds, drought and flood changes in demand. And at the end, customers like able to recover from the extreme events. So if you see uh, impacts describe the effects that threats have an uh, power system, infrastructure systems or processes. So the identification of impacts associated with uh, each that is an important step in assessing vulnerabilities. So uh, if you see uh, threats can impact the power sector in many ways. Impacts are not limited to physical effect on infrastructure. Uh, it can impact on the delivery power. It can impact the percentage of service disrupted effects on power quality, etc. And effect on a capital and operating cost. Additional costs uh, for the uh, safety impacts, metrics of health and safety for the population. And extent of environmental effects also can be, uh, it's a kind of threat to power sector. And if you see uh, power sector vulnerabilities, so uh, power sector vulnerabilities weakness uh, lies with the weaknesses within infrastructure or systems or operations. Yes, we can see these uh, the power sector infrastructure process and system are susceptible to natural, technological and human caused threats. At the same time, the impacts from these threats include potential fuel supply shortages for transportation and energy generation, and which will cause like physical infrastructure damage shifts in energy demand and disruption of uh, electricity supply to the end user. So these kind of, these disruptions in turn adversely affect, uh, affect critical services and facilities. So if you see uh, in terms of, uh, for example, if I say, uh, if you disaster strikes a city or a, a, an area, the, the first uh, impact will be like power outages, which results in uh, uh, which uh, impact the basic functioning of hospital services, water treatments, and communication networks. So like this, as such, if you see, it is vital to understand the threats to the power system and their associated impacts. So uh, if you see power sector vulnerabilities basically uh, fit into two categories. One is infrastructure, and second one is process and systems. So if you talk about infrastructure, the major one of the vulnerabilities like aging infrastructure, why I'm saying aging infrastructure, like aging infrastructure is more vulnerable to impacts from threats. And uh, at the same time, uh, there is one more like insufficient cooling water supply and changes in supply temperature, fuel supply uncertainties, and uh, so undersized the capacity for future needs, restricted supply chain for parts and fuel. At the same time, transmission, because uh, in the transmission phase, we have a uh, aged infrastructure, which can, highly vulnerable to this kind of normal th uh, threats in our like caused by, uh, for example, heavy, uh, high winds or floods, which can easily impacted resulting in the disruption of the transmission networks. So at the same time, if you talk about the process and systems, so uh, the basically limited in operational flexibility, limited generation forecasting, lack of uh, short, mid and uh, long-term plans for infrastructure upgrades, and uh, lack of coordination with other government agencies and lack of coordination and communication between uh, various stakeholders is a major uh, out vulnerable factors which impacts, uh, which create a uh, very uh, threat to power sector resilience. So uh, we know uh, like uh, basically, uh, basically to make our power sector resilient, we have to identify what kind of threats are there? What kind of vulnerabilities are there? And we have to do form a, uh, a basic risk assessment. So by doing this risk assessment, we used to know what kind of risks are there and what kind of risk, uh, accept, uh, risk uh, acceptance is uh, in our, uh, like within our society and what kind of measures we have to take uh, to overcome this risk that kind of uh, clear idea we will get by doing this risk assessment. So uh, for example, uh, if you see uh, the major power generation 
in India in the financial year of 2021, you can see the major portion of the uh, electricity generation is from the thermal power. After that, uh, hydro 11.2.1%. So, if you see uh, the risk assessment is related, uh, like we have to cons uh, consider each kind of uh, uh, thermal plants, like whether it is nuclear, uh, whether it will be hydro, or whether it will be wind, or whether it will be solar, or whether it will be it will be thermal. We have to look after what kind of specific risks are there. What kind of uh, we have to adopt a evolution mechanism, and we have to identify the what kind of acceptance we have lied in our systems, so that we used to get a clear uh, risk in that system. So, uh, if you see, uh, so in detail, if you talk about uh, assess existing situation, that is the first step of risk assessment. So, assess existing conditions and understanding of the existing conditions of the power system uh, in terms of location assets, operational practices, political threats, and other factors helps determine the ability of the power sector to respond and adapt under different operational conditions. If a disruption were to occur uh, during a disaster, during a hazard. So, uh, so, uh, if you see in the planning process, vulnerabilities are often identified to, uh, together with the threats and impacts. So, understanding the existing conditions as well as the potential threats and vulnerabilities along the planning horizon or for infrastructure process and the systems is important uh, to enhance our uh, resilience in power sector. And the second, uh, the next step in the process is to score the severity because we have a number of risks but we have to focus on what are the major risks. So for that, we have to adapt a strategy to score the risk. So the next, uh, if you see uh, uh, the scores, the scores uh, will be combined with the threat and likelihood scores to determine the total risk to the power system. So uh, by this, you used to get the what, like what are the major risks uh, can uh, impact our uh, power, uh, power sources and what kind of uh, like impact it will be created on the uh, network system or transmission and distribution phases. And at the same time, uh, by scoring the risk, we can uh, go for the evaluation. That means based on the score, we used to go for evaluation process. That means which risk is to be uh, taken as a pay on priority basis and then what kind of activities we can carry out for this kind of risk. And there are certain risks we have our own coping capacity to uh, certain risks. So by evaluation also we will get the identity of what kind of risk acceptance we have in our system. So uh, if you talk about the resilient solutions, uh, solutions may uh, fall into different categories uh, of power sector interventions. If you see long term planning, regulations and policies and capital projects. If you talk about long term planning, in the form of comprehensive community plans, threat mitigation plans, and watershed plans, and others. Like these are site specific planning processes, which uh, focusing on the long term resilience of our power sector. And at the same time, regulations and policies such as zoning, subdivision codes, flood plan regulations, and building codes, etc. And uh, if you see, uh, there are uh, programs like uh, capacity building, land acquisitions, and uh, low income housing also one kind of regulation policies which can uh, make our power sector more resilient in nature. And uh, the uh, one of the major thing is your capital projects, such as capital improvement, decentralized backup energy generation for critical facilities, passive storm water management system designs, etc., which uh, if this kind of capital projects is focusing on uh, re-establishing like re-establishing the network to uh, the the back stage after a, after the uh, post disaster scenario so over here we'll talk about some examples of resilient solutions these are kind of uh, best practice like one of the practice uh, solutions throughout the globe for uh, to make the power sector resilient the first one is supply chain assurance. That means we have to maintain the demand supply. Like what kind of demand is generating from the population and what kind of uh, supply we are uh, like maintaining at our sources. So that if you maintain the supply chain insurance, automatically the system will be uh, become more resilient in nature. And if you talk about uh, spatial uh, diver diversification, 
it's just a few. So, uh, spatial diversification is focusing on uh, increased diversification of energy mix compared to single fuel uh, conversion. Uh, like uh, spatial diversification, focusing on instead of focusing on one source of energy. That means now, like instead of focusing on completely on thermal power, we should we should go on hydro power, or we should focus on nuclear power, or we should focus on renewable uh, uh, like power generations like wind power and solar power, so that then diversification of uh, sources uh, can be a uh, factor which impacting the resilient nature in our uh, power sector and uh, micro islandable uh, energy system for critical loads that means microgrids so microgrids is focusing on distributed generation based microgrids capable of islanding can disconnect from the center grid during an outage event and to allow energy to be uh, divided to critical loads so this kind of uh, so this kind of uh, like solutions and critical load panels are at uh, like in emergency facilities and load shedding and hardening infrastructure means if you see in the picture so we have this small uh, electric towers where uh, it was surrounded by uh, green cover which creates a uh, risk to the uh, transmission and the distribution so if you have proper uh, guidelines and proper uh, buffer zones for uh, to be cleared for power lines like that high tension line in which a, like uh, in which area yeah, we have to what kind of buffer zones we have to give for a high, high tension lines what kind of uh, measures should be taken for this kind of transformers and the substations etc uh, this kind of adopting this kind of guidelines will be uh, focusing on uh, reducing the risk in terms of a disaster and underground distribution lines because if you see uh, uh, during cyclones or uh, during cyclones if you see there is uh, expected to be heavy winds of uh, over a speed of maybe one more than 100 km per hour which creates very uh, severe loss to the transmission lines and disruption of power if you uh, adopt the underground distribution lines so the losses can be minimized and fortifying the transmission lines and rising substations. So right, why I'm talking about rising substations is because if you talk about the storm surge or flood situation, if you have a rise of substations, the functioning of the substation can't be disturbed. So this kind of action can be taken care uh, during this, uh, like to adapt the resilience strategies. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, up to now we focus on like uh, we talk about what are the threats and what kind of uh, vulnerabilities are there and where should what kind of solutions we can go for but the major question is uh, for what hazard what kind of uh, resilient uh, what kind of activity what kind of adaptive practice can be opted that is a major question because while adopting these uh, practical solutions there are certain uh, uh, there, there are certain aspects like financials and uh, in environmental aspects which create a huge impact for adopting the practice in the uh, local level on the uh, field level so uh, for that we have to focus on three aspects like the first one is like uh, where should our focus to be placed in the implementation of an enterprise solution so for the answer is options evaluations by priority vulnerabilities like so what is the uh, prior, like, probability of the risk? Like is it high probability or low probability? If it is high probability, how much region it will impact? So if it is low uh, like that, and if it is creating an impact, uh, is it creating on single system or it is creating on the multiple system? So by uh, doing this kind of hypothetical uh, analysis, you will get a clear solution what kind of strategy and then what kind of uh, activity can be adapted to uh, make the system resilient and at the same time how challenging and costly uh, will your resilient solution will be so for that we have to focus on options evolution by cost and complexity so if a practice taking a high cost of implementation and uh, which results in simple implementation so that kind uh, sorry uh, if you talk about if a uh, 
the, in the first scenario, we have to focus on what kind of impact it was creating on the system. And in relation with that, what is the cost of that implementation? Is it high cost or low cost? If it is high cost, then what kind of process it will take? Is it uh, simply implementable or it is? it took, it, it was kind of complex in nature. So this, these are the parameters we have to uh, consider while adopting this uh, resilient solutions in our system. And uh, so how many systems will have uh, added resilient based on your solution? So in the first thing we talk about uh, what is the impact of the risk? Is it region or uh, limited uh, uh, impact? Or is it impacting on single system or multiple system? And what is the cost of implementation? So if you talk about uh, at the same time, you have to talk about what is the cost of implementation in relevance to impact on the system. If it is related to high cost implementation and then only focusing on single system impact. So the focus will be given to high cost of implementation to multi-system impacts or low cost of implementation to multi-system impact. That kind of clear analysis, clear evaluation can be made for adopting the resilient solution. So if you see, uh, so in the overview, so up to now we talk about the what are the uh, threats, what are the vulnerabilities, and then what are the resilient solutions. And then, so uh, as a uh, summary, we can talk about how this planning for power sector resilience can be done. Is like first, you have to focus on assess uh, threats and vulnerabilities. First, we have to engage the stakeholders to gather the data. That means we have to identify the stakeholders relevant to power sector. And we have to gather the data. That means uh, like identify the necessary energy systems and resources, gaps and vulnerabilities, and impacts of system failure. So uh, in the data phase, uh, data collection phase, you have to focus on what kind of resources and system we have, what are the gaps and vulnerabilities, and if one system failures, what kind of impact it is creating on the uh, transmission or distribution of the power sector. And based on the data, we have to identify the as uh, assess threats and vulnerabilities. So in the phase, we have to focus on define and assess threats together with their impacts and likelihoods, as well as the associated power sector vulnerabilities and their uh, CVRTs. So after identifying the threats and vulnerabilities, we have to develop the strategies. So we have to identify and prioritize the solutions to address these vulnerabilities and incorporate uh, guidance into existing power sector plans. So uh, while uh, adopting these developing strategies, we have to focusing on the uh, the parameters which I uh, told earlier. Like we have to focus on uh, what is the cost of implementation. Uh, is it uh, complex in nature, or is it to be implementable, or uh, what kind of financial uh, financial assistant it need financial assistance it needed, and uh, is it serving only uh, single uh, system or multiple systems like that. After that, we have to enact the policies related to uh, adopt the policies to realize full benefits of power system resilience strategies and coordinate their implementations and implementation. And after this, because uh, we have to evaluate the process, because while planning, plan always plan is to be a uh, like a cyclic process. That means we mm -hmm. used to adapt the solution because right now. Uh, there are so many innovations, so many inventions has been going uh, for like through like by uh, technological advances, uh, advances and uh, other innovations also which making like people are more into uh, problem, uh, so pro like more into the finding the solution problem problems. So while this evaluation process, uh, again we can go for the engaged stakeholders and gather data assets and then at the phase, we can identify the new uh, inventions or new strategies which can be adapted and then which can be practices to may, uh, to address the risk and then to make the system resilient. So, uh, so uh, here, uh, so uh, I would like to uh, conclude my topic by uh, if you see. Uh, to make our power sector resilient and uh, we have to focus on redundancy and diversification. 
diversification why i'm telling you like uh, instead of focusing on the traditional energy sources we should focus on the renewable energy sources which are uh, uh, which can be a major source in the coming future and increasing the power sector resilience also and uh, renewable energy can play a wide valuable role in power sector resilience and the major thing is policy matters because uh, don't forget to incorporate the good policy design into technical advancement strategies and uh, in our planning process we have to uh, adopt the term resilience as a part of larger integrated planning process and if you see resilient planning is a iterative process that means plans has to be evolved as context and threats change based on the site because if you go for mlr resilient the threats may be different from the uh, the uh, threats in the southern plains so based on the site specific threats we have to make the resilience planning activities so uh, like this uh, by making the proper planning by making the proper planning and then by identifying the threats and then by uh, threats and vulnerabilities by identifying the proper strategies and then by adapting the enabling policies in uh, we can uh, achieve the uh, resilience in power sector so with this i will conclude my talk back to you anil sir Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hari, for your uh, wonderful talk, uh, in which uh, you uh, highlighted, you, uh, you provided insight on how we can enhance the resilience of uh, a power sector. Uh, you also illustrated uh, various uh, a number of resilience examples were, were also uh, highlighted by you. And in uh, recently, a study was uh, done uh, to explore the resilience of uh, Indian power sector to climate change. As uh, power grids are vulnerable to disruptions, uh, they are uh, vulnerable to da damage to horse uh, weather conditions. And uh, India um, has been ranked as seventh most climate affected country in the world uh, by a global climate uh, risk uh, index. And impact of climate uh, change are expected to increase over the coming years. Uh, like for example, like uh, this uh, rise uh, in temperature, rising temperature, they are expected to result in water scarcity and uh, inefficiency of hydro generation systems uh, and this uh, extreme wind speeds and rainfall, they will cause damage uh, or adverse impact uh, to generation, to transmission, as well as distrib distribution infrastructure of power sector so uh, the disaster management frameworks of the power industry they should uh, leveraged and uh, newer more customized plans uh, should be there uh, more uh, this um, planning should be uh, established and implemented uh, to reflect the long term uh, uncertain unexpected uh, character of uh, this uh, disaster various disasters and to reflect a resilience requirement uh, regulation governing uh, power sectors, equipment standards, electric, electrical costs, uh, energy procurement, and uh, this uh, you know, all this uh, process uh, must be updated. And as uh, you also highlighted, that uh, resilience planning is uh, not a, a single time uh, planning; it is uh, irritate, uh, iterative. So uh, this uh, plans, a uh, resilience plan, it should be evolved, it should be updated uh, periodically on the basis of the uh, current uh, situations. So uh, once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hari, for joining us and enlightening our participant. And as I can see, there is uh, no query raised by our participant. Uh, but if uh, there will be any, uh, we will be happy to share with you. Thank you, sir. So uh, moving to the next and uh, last presentation of the th uh, third day. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Raju Thapa, uh, who is uh, Technical Officer, Emergency Management uh, in uh, VHS CDC India. And uh, prior to uh, joining CDC, uh, we had pleasure to work with uh, Dr. Thapa. He, he was working as a junior consultant in Center for Early Warning and Communication in GMR Division of an idea. 
and he has also uh, worked as a research fellow in Department of Science and Technology, Science and Engineering Research Board, and Board of Research in Nuclear Science, as well as a Department of Atomic, uh, Atomic uh, Energy. And uh, Dr. Thapa has also penned more than uh, 30 research publications, as well as book chapters in some of the leading uh, journals, and he has expertise uh, in the field of remote sensing, GIS, and its application to water resource uh, a contaminant uh, hydrogeology as well as a uh, groundwater potential mapping and uh, landslide assessment. And today, Dr. Thapa will be uh, enriching our knowledge uh, a propose of uh, early warning systems. So with these words, I pass on the stage to you, sir. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, Dr. Thapa, you are audible. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, it was really wonderful session from uh, Hari, Mr. Hari, uh, talking about so many points that he has highlighted were so, so good so up to the topic uh, and highlighting all the problems also. And in the end, giving such wonderful suggestions also. So uh, it has made my task much more uh, easier to uh, to speak now uh, after uh, after such an illustrious uh, and word detailed presentation so uh, like i think uh, for the last two days what we have discussed already power sector is one of the most important infrastructure of our country needless to say and as growth of the sector is directly correlated with the economic growth of the country and we have to understand that any disruption in the power sector due to the crisis or due to the or the, due to the disaster it will create a hardship to the human being as every aspect of the human life is directly or indirectly it is associated with the electricity just for an example take uh, the medium that we are joined today all of us in this virtual uh, gathering uh, e either by your laptop or by your pc or by your uh, or by your mobile phones anything everything is charged uh, because of uh, power, right? Because either by electricity or solar power, but we need electricity in our day-to-day -day life, everything. We cannot imagine uh, living, uh, we have come to such a time that it's very hard for, for us to even live without electricity for a few days also. So this, and uh, India, you know, it has experienced many natural disasters such as drought, flood, uh, even earthquake, cyclone during the past. And it has also experienced that uh, man-made crisis, such as the uh, sometimes the terrorist attacks, the sometimes there are strikes, fires, etc. cetera, and, uh, and the natural disasters, uh, the, um, the natural hazards and the man-made uh, disasters uh, always involve losses, damage uh, of the infrastructure of the country. And in, in most of the times you will see that our uh, power sector infrastructure are also damaged and in order to illuminate or uh, if not possible we can minimize this damage or disruption in in generations in transmission and in distributions of electric sector so it becomes very very extremely important to uh, to evolve the disaster management you know our whole concept uh, for this power sector and we need to understand the importance of the early warning system uh, whether uh, for any disasters um, which uh, Hari has highlighted uh, th three important disasters that was uh, nat the natural disaster, the technological and the human cause for any any disasters. If you can have some sort of early warning, some early indications that will be beneficial. And that was the target uh, that was given to me to highlight in today's uh, session. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I hope by now you have already have an idea that uh, our country as a whole is, is, is among the most disaster prone country uh, all over world. Uh, specifically speaking is the third most disaster prone country in the world just after China and US. And if you will see, you will be surprised to know that uh, out of the top 10 countries, eight countries uh, are, are in Asia. So which clearly speaks that Asia itself is one of the most uh, disaster prone continent. So that's why uh, that is one of the point that why we need to enhance our uh, disaster risk reduction and resilience approach with uh, which Hari, Hari was also emphasize, emphasizing. 
and uh, this whole concept of early warning and uh, an early warning system or multi hazard early warning system uh, rightly to be say uh, it, it is something that everybody is talking about not only in india abroad also the importance of early warning system has been re realized uh, by all nations that's why uh, you will see whenever you talk about the key agreement that are there whether the paris agreement cop 21 or the sustainable development sdg that we saw uh, we call sustainable development goals which is the successor of the um, millennium development goal mdg or the you take the sendai framework for disaster risk reduction which is the successor of uh, the hugo framework uh, in all that you will see a touch of um, uh, you know you know the the importance and the highlight of the early warning system out there and particularly in such uh, in sendai framework in the uh, there it has seven global targets and uh, particularly on the seven target it specifically talks about uh, you know uh, to increase the availability and accessibility to multi hazard early warning system and disaster risk information once you have such a early warning system in your power grid or in power sector also uh, then uh, then i think we can take some informed uh, actions based on that which definitely will uh, will not only reduce the impact on our infrastructure but will also help us to reduce the damages or effect on our uh, our system uh, that will definitely you know save a lot of money in uh, re in our rehabilitation and recovery and uh, and our uh, prime minister sri narendra modi ji also he gave the uh, pm 10 point agenda where he uh, again which are the 10 point mantras um, to enhance our country disaster risk reduction and resilience there also in several points you will see that he has specifically talked about that we have to increase our uh, science and technology we have to leverage that so that we can use that science and technology lever and um, you know advancement in science and technology uh, and to to reduce our um, resilience towards disaster and that implies to our power sector also because uh, like i earlier said power sector is one of the very crucial sector for our day, our country's development and progress so uh, that's why i say that uh, we need to understand about the need for disaster risk reduction and resilience and uh, like hari also highlighted uh, and i also said that you take there are several disasters that affect on uh, on our power sector suppose the power grid you take for example uh, sometimes due to cyclone you will see that most of the time during cyclone because of the tree fall or uh, or because of the tower fail because of the high speed wind the towers the electrical poles sometimes they fail down like right? so uh, leading to some uh, black you know blackouts or sometimes power cut for few days so such type of incidents are there this is just a minor case sometimes there are flood like scenario which 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 remains there for weeks for sometimes for months which again lead to uh, a very you know disruption in our power particularly power um, you know, power supplies which again disrupt the whole uh, functioning of the community of the people that that we that sector we have to say we have to understand we have to realize that there is a need for disaster risk reduction and resilience approach and um, and uh, focusing on early warning and communication is one of the best method that we can um, we can implement that uh, so need for uh, need for early warning system what i will basically say that you take any disaster sometimes earthquake cyclone like i said flood fire everywhere you will see there is a chance of tsunami you there there are particular landslide in hilly areas sometimes the uh, whole systems are wiped out the electrical powers uh, like grid the power station they are wiped away because of the landslides so uh, and even i think uh, you have seen uh, there are sometimes because of the landslides chamoli also you have seen some some pictures where uh, the power hydropower plant were swept away you know so that's why we have to understand that uh, we need an early warning system but one important thing i want to uh, highlight here is why do we need yeah, this early warning system uh, you will and hari like in in his uh, in his uh, presentation mr hari said that vulnerability where he talked about uh, the importance of uh, you know the vulnerability to infrastructure the vulnerability to process and system so that specifically talks that that is very well well said and particularly that that gives the whole concept concept of the three s that we talk about that is the safeguard of the staff the first s the safeguard of the stuff 
our infrastructure and the safeguard of the system. The three S concept that we use the staff, the stuff and the system. So the whole concept of early warning is, is, is focused on that, the three S concept that is, uh, that is there. So uh, staff uh, basically here, um, we mean to say the entire people out there because the safeguard of the life of the people is the primary, th primary, you know, our, uh, the first objective of that, the, our prime, th prime objective is that to safeguard the life of the people. That is the staff and the and the stuff, the infrastructure that are that are there, that also needs to be safeguarded. And that is also our priority whenever we are talking about early warning system and the and the environment and the and the system as a whole, that is also there. So the, the three S uh, to safeguarding and enhancing our three S is our topmost priority. And like I said, if we don't invest in early warning system. Uh, then, then we have to uh, we have to accept that the cost of investment in reconstruction and recovery once we have already once we are struck with disaster is always very high. So that's why it's it is always uh, better that we invest in meeting preparedness rather than investing in reconstruction and recovery. And uh, this whole approach uh, that we are talking about uh, for power sector, that uh, the enhancement of uh, you know uh, early warning and the importance of and uh, rather we and having a proactive approach rather than a reactive approach. This is not something that was there throughout the uh, throughout there you know from history. Like this is something our country has developed uh, over years, and this is something our country has has been uh, working on it. So working on it. So if you'll see our traditional approach, how you how we used to uh, tackle disasters it will clearly you will see that earlier what we have to do what what was our system was that we used to have landslides we used to have cyclones floods earthquake tsunami you know a disaster we need, we used to have disasters and based on that disaster our response were formulated whether uh, for the relief whether for the recovery you know that things was uh, based on the disasters uh, after occurrence of disaster rather so basically we used to have some uh, you know and um, and uh, response based rather than reactive approach but uh, there were a few incidents that has that were there in, in in the past that has completely changed the mindset the concept of the uh, of our governments also and not only india take abroad also uh, which has made people to take disasters very seriously and and to and to include disaster management in every aspect of their planning in every aspect of their policies which uh, which was also highlighted by hari uh, Take the example of Bhuj earthquake also, which was one of India's one of the most uh, serious uh, earthquake disasters in 2001. That was there. That was also that also marked and a turning point in 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 you know in the whole thinking process of how what is disaster management. Not only that, even in 2004, uh, the uh, we know I think everybody knows the Boxing Day the. Uh, the tsunami that we faced 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. That was uh, that also. Um, because of the you know the magnitude of this disaster, uh, it 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 caused a lot of uh, uh, you know change in the thinking of the uh, you know big big people, the bureaucrats, the the policy makers, and and the whole concept of this managing disaster risk uh, it it took up to a next level where where every where we wait later on we talked about the hazards we talked about the exposure vulnerability it was there but uh, after this incident the, this whole thing become more you know it it became it came to more limelight and after that in 2005 we have uh, the our dm act disaster management act also later on which again institutionalize all our activities per towards disaster management and uh, the hazards uh, the importance to understand hazard the important to understand exposure vulnerability and risk uh, i think you you have already discussed uh, earlier uh, in presentation so that has always all been highlighted now that's why we have an enhanced approach uh, even in power sector also so if you have some early indications of some incident early warning of some incident you can take some early actions in power sectors also based on that early actions uh, you can uh, you can have an rather enhanced approach towards any disasters uh, and our response will be much better 
uh, the casualties will be much lesser and the and the cost of reconstruction and rehabilitation will be much lesser so all that can be achieved if if we have rather and more enhanced approach rather than a traditional approach for that we have to accept and we have to try to incorporate um, uh, some early warning systems some early warning and prediction mechanism wherever possible and uh, whenever we are talking about early warning system, uh, we have to understand the uh, this whole system is not a one piece. It, it's a combination of different component. Uh, and this whole component, when they come together in one uh, and, and they combine, then only you can have an effective early warning system. And uh, each section is a topic for itself. And uh, we have to understand that when these four component that are next knowledge, monitoring and warning services, dissemination and communications, and response capacity. When all these four component, uh, they, they work uh, in, in collaboration, in coordination with each other, then only we can have an effective early warning system. And uh, let me just uh, give you a touch of each component risk knowledge uh, like i think already been said but i'll just highlight in short that it's nothing it, it's it's identifying what are the hazards in your area what and systematic assessment rather i will say about the hazards about the vulnerability about the exposure what are the risks that are prevailing there and uh, the vulnerability it it will aim to uh, you know to locate the weak point i will say um, in your power sector or in power sectors, what are the weak points to improve our system, our security, our stability? So it could be anything, whether in the supply chain or whether in the storation, whether in the distributions, wherever that that weakness may be. But once if if we have if we do our risk knowledge properly with with proper assessment tools. Uh, incorporating all the checkpoints that we, that are needed, and and you you know identifying what are the level exposures, what are, what could be the pathway from which the risks could come, what are the uh, you know sensitivity to hazards. If we consider all these component, then I think we can have we can have a very sound risk knowledge, and based on that uh, sound risk knowledge, then we can further proceed ahead with monitoring and warning services. And uh, this component, uh, whenever we talk about monitoring and warning services, this is one of the most important component of any early warning system, uh, particularly because, um, you know, uh, the things that we need to monitor, uh, we, we because things changes in, in a real environment, which is very dynamic, thing changes within second, okay? So that's why their continuous monitoring, monitoring of these parameters is very important para very important steps so that's why uh, in in, in uh, power sector also if uh, you know particularly based on the geographic locations you need to consider the component that you need to monitor in you know, on a regular basis uh, suppose if you are uh, if if the power sector that we're talking about if your stations or if your uh, that uh, your working station is located in the coastal areas then the parameters that you could be measuring is uh, suppose uh, uh, for flood you could be m measuring rainfall right or uh, in hilly areas uh, because of the uh, earthquake or uh, you know to understand the earthquake you can monitor the seismic waves uh, all that thing okay so uh, and also apart from that and for the, for the monitoring of these parameters you can choose various ways now with the advancement of science and technology there are several options that are available you know, particularly the remote sensing and gis uh, the satellite imagery that we talk about the satellite uh, whole the satellite techni uh, technology that are there at present scenario it has been a boon to um, particularly to disaster management sector because a large area can be covered within a very small span of time and uh, that and with a very limited uh, you know resource um, even uh, even a good person who know who have the information who have the right knowledge how to use satellite information can access a large area sitting in one small lab you know and in very small short period of time he can give a very vital information that could that can be useful for the people who are working on ground so such type of you know, technology that are available that can be used extensively in our power sectors also suppose 
uh, uh, if there is an area that is vulnerable to uh, any any particular disaster satellite technology can be used to find out some alternative ways how that can be uh, you know move from point a to point b without uh, you know excluding or reducing the risk of that vulnerability you can find out an alternative way all that can be done using remote sensing and gis Apart from that, the land-based radars are also there, which can also be used to monitor some of the uh, some of the parameters or proxy variables that we say to understand about any disaster. On on-ground measurement are also important, particularly for whenever uh, we are we are measuring the flood or water table of rivers or uh, sea, you know sea level water water. Whenever you are measuring the water level, that types of uh, in that type of situation, on ground uh, measurement are also important, and all these informations it needs to be um, uh, collected and it needs to be interpreted also for that. And a good uh, expert is needed who can understand those data and who can come out with an uh, Im uh, meaningful information uh, using those data so that uh, those data uh, you know are used. Uh, in in uh, in in uh, in predicting the future, you know, for, for future predictions, so that uh, necessary actions, whatever is necessary, is taken based on those informations. And the third component, which is there, is the uh, dissemination and um, and communication. After monitoring. Uh, the information or the uh, or the uh, you know the critical i will say the crucial information or the crucial warning that is generated it needs to be disseminated further uh, in your uh, suppose in your power if you power sector in, in your chain or you know from top to uh, down down or from down to up you know both ways it needs to be disseminated in any and needs and it needs to be communicated not only to the within the organization and outside the organizations also for that there are several ways that can be done uh, uh, within if within system you can use the you know that there are telephonic uh, communications there are websites there are emails that we that there are nowadays you know even the um, uh, mobile app the social media is also playing very important role where uh, where messages it we can send a one small messages to a large number of people very quickly and since people have uh, more access to social media, they get those information also very quickly. And there were, uh, if, if 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 that information needs to be generated for the co you know for the common people, then several other means such as radio, newspapers, the siren, speakers. When you when you are in the community settings, uh, the community radio, all that can be a very uh, useful means uh, for disseminating of information. And uh, uh, one more uh, component which makes the whole uh, this our early warning and system uh, co complete is uh, the response capacity. So particularly the response capacity is nothing. It is the, the capacity of our organizations to respond uh, to one disasters, uh, you know, after the disaster event. So like I said, uh, even though we prepare to our fullest, we cannot stop all natural disaster for, from uh, from occurring. So we have to increase our response capacity also. Um, for that, we need um, you know skilled staff. We need skilled staff, and we need uh, one system also, so that um, we can work uh, you know in collaboration with everybody and. Uh, and even the community who are there, because we talk about community as the first, uh, as the first and the last responder. So that's why we need to have our, um, you know, community also trained with their response capacity also, and it needs to be enhanced. And for that, there are several, uh, several initiatives that even our government of India has taken. And suppose the uh, Abda Mitra is there, and there are several other initiatives also that are that have been taken so that. Uh, the community uh, becomes well prepared for disasters, right? And uh, this um, response capacity can be enhanced by regular mock drills uh, that can be conducted with the community, or um, uh, considering other other like uh, you know regular trainings uh, that can be provided uh, to the people, to the staff, uh, how to act upon this, uh, you know a certain kind of disaster. Uh, and not only uh, training, giving them some checklist which needs to be taken care of uh, during disaster. That kind of that kind of uh, uh, incident will enhance our um, our 
you know response capacity and one more thing that we need to consider is to, is to, to increase the belief of the community or to increase the belief of the uh, of the staff on the warnings um, for that that's why we say uh, if regularly we release warnings or uh, you know um, or informations that are not uh, true uh, that will reduce in what that will re that will reduce the belief of the common people belief of the system Believe of the people on the system. That's the need to ensure that whenever there are warnings, information that is disseminated to the people, to the to the to the general masses as a whole, it needs to be correct, and we need to double check it before it comes out to the public, so that the trust of the people on the warnings is not broken, and it, rather it is more enhanced and more more strengthened. So for that, we need to ensure every time. Uh, so that's why we, I think everybody has uh, everybody knows the story of uh, one king when he asks uh, six blind people to go and touch uh, to go and see how an elephant looked like. So all of them they went to the elephant, uh, they feel the elephant with their hand, and uh, some uh, the the person who was touching his uh, you know stomach he'd say like elephant is a, like a wall. The pro, somebody who was touching his uh, tail he says like elephant is like a rope. Somebody who was trying touching his you know leg he, they were saying it is like a tree. So the uh, the main uh, you know motor the the main learning point from this story is that none of them are wrong, but uh, if you take any, if you think of a disaster from only one perspective, from only one, if you take understand disaster management from one under, from one perspective, that will not give you a complete picture. To see a complete picture, we need to have everybody on board. We need to collaborate. We need to, uh, you know, uh, we you, we need to work in consistently, uh, you know, consistently in collaboration, in coordination uh, amongst all the stakeholders. Like I said, uh, like I talked about risk knowledge, uh, there might be several stakeholders who might be engaged in, uh, in in risk knowledge because there are so many nodal agencies who are there, who have been assigned the nodal responsibility uh, for various hazards. Suppose for cyclone, our India Meteorological Department (IMD) uh, under Ministry of um, uh, Earth Sciences, they are responsible for issuing any early warnings uh, related to uh, our um, you know cyclone. Similarly, for uh, landslides, uh, GSI is, is the nodal agency. Uh, similarly, for uh, tsunami, our inquiries is there who is looking after that. Uh, earthquake, MCS is there. So, uh, what I basically means to say is that we have different different organizations, even in one small sector, risk knowledge. I'm just uh, saying uh, one component of the water system. So, you can imagine if you consider the whole. I think uh, due to some technical glitch, uh, Dr. Thapa has got disconnected. Uh, we will wait, uh, wait for a couple of minutes uh, so that uh, Dr. Thapa can rejoin us. So please have patience uh, till then. Hello, Dr. Thapa.
Dr. Thapa will be with us in a couple of minutes. Uh, till then, I uh, once again request a participant uh, because I am getting que uh, repeated query on the e-certificates. Uh, I once again remind you all that for e-certificate, it is uh, mandatory to register on uh, an IM training portal and to enroll for this. So, uh, Dr. Thapa is back again. Sorry, sorry, sir, for uh, the inconvenience caused. I think uh, because of my network issue, I lost yeah, the connectivity. Yeah. Uh, so, so let you, Dr. Thapa, you can continue. Sorry, sorry for the inconvenience. Sir. Thank no you, issue. Sir. No yeah. issue. Is my presentation visible? Yes, yes, your presentation is visible. You are audible also. Okay, okay, sir. So, uh, where did I lose my connectivity, sir? In this slide only, right? Yes, yes, Dr. Thapa. Oh, thank you, thank you. So, uh, so sorry, sorry for the inconvenience caused, uh, participants. So, like I was saying, so uh, uh, so that's why we need to talk about the coordination and collaboration. That was one of my points. Uh, and uh, communication during disaster. One more, uh, I, one thing I would like to say that uh, in any disaster situation, particularly when you talk about uh, those disasters where. Uh, in cyclone or, uh, you know, in, in coastal areas when you have huge cyclone that are coming up, most of the time the communication system our is break, uh, it's, it's disrupted. Uh, along with that, even our electricity, sometimes uh, those our poles, electric poles that are also get, uh, it also get disrupted. So um, for that, we need to come up with, uh, you know, alternative solutions so that uh, those type of uh, incidents can be lessened or it can be at least reduced. So uh, overall, what we have understand is that uh, uh, in overall, in totality, that uh, in any effective end-to-end uh, -end, uh, and people-centered uh, early warning uh, system, it consists of four component, uh, which needs to be focused. The uh, primary fourth component are, you know, the um, risk knowledge um, that we have to consider whenever we are talking about uh, that we have to uh, understand the risk that are prevailing in any say, sector or any particular area of your interest. The second component is the um, monitoring and uh, assessment where we, we talk about monitoring of uh, the parameters or monitoring of the you know, identified hazards that are there and monitoring and warning services, giving us warnings also. And the third component is uh, where the information is disseminated to the right people at the right time through right medium, you know, uh, uh, so that effective and very informative actions can be taken. And the last component is the response capacity. Uh, even though we focus on all these other components, rich knowledge uh, and uh, our uh, monitorings and uh, disseminations, we also need to work on our response capacity also so that in, in time of crisis, uh, we can respond e efficiently and uh, reducing the um, casualties also and uh, minimizing our losses to properties also. Just to uh, just to give you an, one example that uh, how early warning system work, I have just taken the, an example of a flood because uh, most of the time we have seen that flood is also you know, when we have flood in particular areas, sometimes the whole uh, system, electrical system also sometimes it goes out because it is uh, the fly, the the plant which is there it or it gets inundated by water so i have i thought just just give you an example say, for flood early how flood early warning system so uh, the central water commission uh, is the is the nodal agency who is looking after um, giving early warnings for flood uh, and uh, there are just for your information our central water commission it it, it gives 5 days uh, uh, you know uh, forecasting also for flood what will be the uh, flood uh, scenario uh, it, in their websites if you go you will find 5 day pre, uh, 5 day forecasting and one other initiatives that is there is that uh, and uh, the collaboration of our C C central water commissions with uh, uh, google where they combine together and um, and the our you know cwc uh, they have their sets of um, uh, measuring um, monitoring stations that are uh, there on the ground they have their own sets of uh, monitoring stations where regular data are taken about the water level so those data are been uh, shared with google 
from our government side and Google with their satellite imagery, uh, they use this Google dam generation. Basically, those who know use remote sensing, they will have no little idea about this dam. Dam is nothing. This is the digital elevation model, which basically gives you the um, idea about the elevation, so about the height of any particular area. So this they use that uh, Google dam generations, Google dam model, and they also feed the um, measurement or data that the, the central from the CWC that has been shared. And based on this data, they generate and 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 uh, model. And in this model, what they do, they overlap several parameters, as you can see here. They overlap several parameters based on their parameters that generate one. Uh, modeling based on modeling, they get the details of what could be the inundation in different part of the area of a particular area of interest. So, as you can see, the measurement that uh, has been shared by C uh, CWC and see in any particular area, they can get the details like which which area will be inundated if this much water is flowing from this area this river. What will be the level of inundation? Even exactly up to the what will be the high of water in your particular area all that information is there and it is available at your fingertip you, you know uh, or if you just go to the google and if you type all that information you will get directly in google so this is one initiatives of uh, google and our uh, government of india and this information is not only available for the public they also um, shared uh, in this information with our uh, with our government also so that necessary actions can be taken well ahead of time and uh, these um, informations are also shared with some of the uh, NGOs also, so that those informations uh, that can be distributed immediately to the community also. So, uh, so in a community based early warning system is also one of the point that is gaining focus where the community, the, we make the community self sustain so that they can, um, they can, uh, you know, uh, function or they can complete all the parts right from risk knowledge to monitoring to disseminating and taking response activity they can perform all the tracks uh, all the tasks by themselves and making themselves sustain uh, that is one of the th one of the thing that we, can, we, we you know indian government is working extensively towards that also so in the end uh, there are a few things uh, that i like to end like uh, we are talking about uh, the very important sector power sector and we are talking about employ and uh, you know uh, using this state of the art using early warning and communication system in all the in all actions as possible there are a few things which needs to be considered that uh, Effective governance and institutional arrangement is one of the most important factor because uh, uh, it uh, there are so many uh, you know steps or actions that needs to be taken at the top most you know top level uh, right from plan to policies to their implementation plan all that um, activities needs to be incorporated so effective governance is one of the most important part apart from that a multi hazard approach is um, also important here uh, i'll just refer to uh, mr hari presentation where he talked about the triple disaster where uh, a tsunami uh, lead to flood like scenario and because of the flood like scenario there was a problem in the uh, in the nuclear reactor and because of that uh, there was the third disaster so uh, you you need to understand that it is not always uh, a problem that uh, uh, the um, power grid will have sometimes a uh, one disaster may lead to effect in other disaster like a, a landslide may result in um, in affecting the power sector right so similarly so that's why the whole concept of multi hazard approach comes into play so we need to have a multi hazard approach rather than focusing on one hazard we need to focus on all hazard um, you know and and have a multi hazard system so that uh, our warning system gets uh, gets uh, activated most of the time and uh, and we 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 have a rather more active system rather than one single um, uh, single you know targeted hazards and involvement of community, local community is one of the most important factor, like I said, because uh, sometimes the areas are very in a remote area. So until unless you have the active engage engagement of local community, uh, any implementation plan will not um, be that successful. And cons consider some gender perspective in, a, in disaster, whenever we're talking about disaster, uh, we need to consider gender perspective. The, uh, the, we need to consider about the our elderly people, the um, physically, uh, 
have you know uh, different people we have to uh, we have to bring everybody in the picture then only we can uh, resolve this issue and uh, if you talk about who are the key actors who, who have to play a role here uh, the community, no doubt, they are one of the most important, uh, you know, the actors who play a role in uh, in um, early warning system. Apart from their local governments who are in constant touch with the community also, and the local government who are in constant touch with the central governments also. This local government, they also try to, um, they also play a very important role in binding the community with the central government because. Uh, the central government, they themselves have a very important role in plan, in implementing plans and policies that is uh, more uh, beneficial to the community, um, um, you know, in their favor, uh, considering all their challenges. And uh, that needs, that points need to be highlighted to the central government because and in that local government also has a very important role to play. Uh, and uh, apart from that, uh, the central government, they also uh, contribute by, uh, you know, by finalizing the funds, how the things will go. They, they do a lot of things right from uh, planning to implementing and the regional or institutions also, they, are, they also have a very important role to play. Uh, as you have seen in the COVID-19 also, suppose the WHO, they, they played a very important role. Um, similarly, uh, uh, sometimes we, uh, the regional institutions, what they can do is uh, they can share case studies also. It is not that always we have to learn from our own mistakes. Sometimes we can learn from the mistakes of other countries also. Suppose in, in other countries, if uh, in power sector, if there, there was some incident that has reduced to... Uh, that has that has leads to some catastrophic event uh, these regional institutions they can document such incident and they can share it uh, in the public domain so that other people can learn from it and uh, they can uh, understand the lesson learned and take the way forward and implement that in our in our uh, perspective and there are institutional bodies international bodies also uh, uh, who can contribute either by funding or uh, or by implementing some uh, you know some uh, some initiatives from their end the ngos uh, they they have a very important role to play because they are considered to be very close to the community and um, now, since they are there in the community, they understand the problems that are there in the community and that they can play an important role in highlighting those problems. And the private sector also have a very important role to play. Um, and the, the science and academic session. Science and academic, definitely they have a role to play uh, in bringing out the challenges, in bringing out the new concept that will uh, supplement our uh, government for, uh, for implementation of effective early warning system. So uh, in the end, a few of the way forwards that I would like to highlight from my presentations uh, are, uh, sorry, uh, there is a requirement for a strengthening disaster, uh, disaster risk. Uh, uh, we need to strengthen when we are talking about disaster risks, even uh, Hari was talking about that. We need to uh, talk about the risk assessment and he, he mentioned the, about the resilience. We have to focus on resilience. And in his way forward, he was highlighting several other points. So similarly, we have to work uh, towards that. And, uh, and the public and private investment in the, in disaster risk reduction that needs to be um, that needs to be incre uh, increased. Like I said, because uh, public participation is uh, very important. And uh, uh, technological innovation broadcasting it needs to be uh, there. And also, uh, we need to understand the uh, you know the need of the com community also for uh, further action. So uh, in the end, I will say that uh, whether uh, we, you are in any sector, uh, we need to understand the importance of uh, having at least in today's perspective, every one of us, we need to have some basic understanding of disaster management. We need to have some basic understanding of various um, hazards at least so that Mm, whether we are in scientist or whether we are in politician or whether we are in uh, some important uh, positions in any sector, we play our part in enhancing our resilience towards disaster so that we as a uh, country, we as a nation have a rather more disaster free country and more disaster free nations. So uh, with that, I would like to end my presentation and um, back to you, uh, Anil sir, uh, for, for further uh, actions. Thank you. Thank you for having me. If there are any questions, sir, I, I will be happy to take those questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thapa, for your wonderful 
uh, for sharing your wonderful experience on uh, early warning and uh, communication, uh, focusing on the power sectors. And uh, during uh, your lecture, you also talk about international guidelines and frameworks, how these guidelines and frameworks like uh, Sendai framework, uh, you also talk about sustainable development goals, which uh, highlighted the importance of early warning system for minimizing the losses uh, due to various uh, disasters. And as you mentioned that early warning systems, uh, they are uh, now operated at uh, this local level for some hazards such as floods and at national level to address a variety of hazards. Any additions uh, efforts have also been uh, carried out under the umbrella of uh, this uh, UN since the 90s to promote the implementation uh, for improvement of early warning system around the world. And Dr. Thapa also uh, discussed in detail about the need. Uh, he also highlighted the what are the components and effective early warning systems and uh, communication in respect to increasing number of disasters in the you know, past few years. And he also uh, outlined uh, this uh, monitoring of warning or dissemination, also talk about communication services during emergency response. And um, he also provide insights on uh, this uh, people-centric uh, uh, early warning systems, uh, the importance of people-centric, how, why we need to uh, integrate uh, the communities in, in uh, DRR perspectives. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thapa, once again, for uh, joining us. As I can see, there is uh, no query raised by any participant, um, but if there will be any, we will be uh, surely sharing with you through emails. So once again, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, <clears throat> so now uh, moving to the validation session of this three-day online training program on uh, disaster management for power <coughs> and sectors. <coughs> for this uh, validation session, we uh, we have joined uh, by Professor Surya Prakash, uh, head GMRDs and NIDM, and I now request a uh, uh, sir of, uh, to share his vast experience, uh, his vast uh, knowledge uh, with us uh, through his validation address. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Anilji. Uh, these three days, uh, I think uh, there has been a lot. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. OK, OK. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thanks uh, for providing me this opportunity to share my views uh, during the valediction program of this three days online training program focusing on disaster management in power sector as uh, highlighted by various experts who have been involved uh, during these three days training program uh, power is one of the important and vital functions during the emergencies and disaster situations and uh, most of our activities may not be possible or uh, the emergency support functions may not be possible uh, without the supply of adequate power in those times. However, uh, most disasters, there are the first failures that happen are related to power, communication, and transportation that makes the situation adverse. So therefore, uh, we have to actually think about redundancy, resilience, adaptation, and mitigation, as well as preparedness in uh, power sector particularly for managing the crisis and disaster management situations so therefore we have to look into why does these uh, power lines fail and how can we make alternative arrangements alternative uh, options for supply of power to our communication devices and to other uh, functions which are carried out during the response in disaster situations so therefore first is we should develop resilience in the power sector as resilient infrastructure so that it should not fail in any disaster situation and even if it fails we are able to recover restore the power as quickly as possible that is the first thing so whatever weaknesses we identify in the power sector or causes of uh, the failure in disaster situation in the power sector need to be actually addressed. Second is that uh, how to maintain the supply because uh, times the uh, 
power control rooms fail or sometimes the distribution fails or there may be generation failures or uh, the uh, supply failures so there can be different type of failures in the power sector which may be uh, particularly related to uh, the failure of the towers the so, no ground lines or the tower lines uh, on the poles uh, which are going uh, in these areas and get affected by different type of disasters that is one second is even uh, the failures in the uh, power sector can also generate disasters there have been several instances for example i can call back the upar cinema tragedy which took place in delhi the major cause of the fire was the leakage from the transformer and the sparking which happened and led to the big fire in the far cinema and uh, leading to several casualties at that time similarly several uh, domestic areas and as well as the industrial areas they suffered uh, fire incidents because of overloading short circuiting and uh, improper connections and uh, the electrical leakages leading to uh, the problems of sparking and uh, fires in those areas so there are different types of problems and particularly when it get combined with the natural incidents like for example lightning then uh, more impacts are felt in terms of multiple failures and multiple impacts combined the aggregated impacts and further i would like to cite some of the cases where uh, we actually uh, got trapped in those situations where the uh, not only the power supplies which sometimes need to be shut down in disaster situation remained continued and that resulted into the adverse situations in those areas because uh, the displacements and the failures or deformations of the supply structures and infrastructures actually led to the infringement as well as uh, the failures of the power supplies so the, there are different mechanisms which have been followed there are uh, bureau of indian standards codes which provide provisions uh, for disaster resistant designing implementation monitoring as well as management of power lines including the various other elements uh, that are also present along with those uh, power lines including the tower structures of different types poles underground uh, wire lines pipings and other mechanisms so these are some of these issues and uh, i hope uh, the deliberations for the uh, experts must have enriched our delegates and the participants i would say i was not that fortunate to actually attend all the lectures and learn from these experts but uh, anyway i am very hopeful that whatever they have uh, discussed would be very useful not only in our day to day life but also in Uh, management and reduction of disaster risk and enhancement of resilience against those kind of potential disasters emerging and existing disasters so we can actually try to adapt ourselves change our lifestyles so that we can minimize the incidences of disasters in the power sector and also you no know, enhance the resilience of the infrastructure in power sector besides that we have to see that not only they remain functional in disaster situation but uh, they are able to provide services in any disaster situation so the power sector should not lead to any kind of generation of new risks uh, because of its own uh, activities and functions or infrastructure second is they have to remain functional as emergency support functions during any disaster situation so that timely actions and efficient response and recovery mechanisms can be well implemented so uh, i wish all the best and hope uh, 
not only the uh, delegates who are from the power sector, they will uh, get advantage of this kind of program, but also the other users who are uh, actually consumers of the power supply. And they will also get benefited from this kind of training program. So let's uh, conserve power, protect ourselves from the power failures in disaster situations and also reduce the incidences of disaster risks in the power sector due to the activities and functions of the power sector and also uh, you know, uh, prepare all the personnel in the power sector against all kind of potential risks in their geographical areas due to geodynamic activities or atmospheric activities or hydrological activities taking place around you. Most often, particularly I would say in the industrial sector, the power sector plays an important role. And uh, there are different type of power generation devices and power supply devices that are used. And I remember I was associated for some time with a major uh, power project of Power Grid Corporation Limited, uh, which was actually having power supplies of about 800 kV, 8 lakh volt, and also 400 kV, 4 lakh volt uh, transmission lines, uh, which uh, were supplying power from the power generating stations at the dam sites to the power distribution centers. So uh, the kind of uh, electrical supplies and the voltages that goes through these power lines are really very high and they require due attention. For example, in terms of our construction of the buildings, there are set guidelines that how far that building environment should be or built environment should be from the uh, power, uh, these kind of high voltage transmission lines or the tower lines. So those uh, regulations and control measures must be well uh, enforced monitored and uh, regulated by concerned authorities so i hope uh, this will get us also some guidance in terms of uh, standard operational procedures for the uh, functions of the power sector to become uh, resilient infrastructure against any kind of disaster risk so thank you very much and I wish all, all the best in terms of safe, healthy and good quality life on an equitable, justifiable and right-based manner with good fraternity. Wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for sharing your thoughts uh, on this three-day online training program on disaster management for uh, power sector. As a high delta, the importance of power sector, uh, which is one of the most important infrastructure of the country, as a growth of uh, power sector is directly correlated with the economic growth of uh, any country. And uh, comprehending the importance of uh, this sector, power sector, we should uh, deploy resilience in power sector against uh, you know, various hazards and also. Uh, we also be prepared how to quickly revive uh, the supply of power once it is interrupted uh, due to any unpleasant events. So uh, thank you very much, sir, for joining us and for enlightening us and our participants through your address. Uh, so uh, now uh, moving uh, to vote of thanks. Uh, a number of uh, experts throughout the three days have shared uh, their knowledge and their uh, experience with us on a number of uh, themes that are related to power sectors, uh, like um, on the first day, basic elements and concepts of focusing power sectors were discussed, and also uh, electric uh, electricity safety uh, procedure and manuals were uh, dis discussed by our experts. And on second day, uh, building climate change resilience for electricity infrastructure and power grid collapse response and restoration as well as uh, template of the Astra management plan was discussed. And on the last and third day, uh, our experts uh, uh, delivered their talk on how uh, planning for resilient of uh, power sector as well as uh, the last presentation was on early warning system and uh, communication uh, related to power sector. So um, time is to thank all the 
uh, efforts made by uh, our experts and as well as uh, other dignitaries who have uh, who are a part of this three day online training program so uh, before uh, drawing the curtain of this three day uh, program on disaster management for power sector i take this uh, privilege uh, to thank uh, vote of, uh, to propose vote of thanks and out at the outset, I would like to thank Professor Suri Prakash, Head GMR Division and IDM, uh, who graced the validation session and also enlightened uh, us through his wisdom. And I also take this opportunity to thank our eminent uh, speakers, our, our experts, uh, namely Dr. Harjit Kaur, Junior Consultant and IDM, Dr. Gautam Kumar, uh, who is Assistant Professor, uh, National Fire Service College, uh, Dr. YP Chawla, a senior Research Fellow, International Institute of Information Technology, Pune, uh, Mr. Rajiv Porwal, uh, Chief General Manager, POSCO, and uh, Mr. Hari uh, Kumar, uh, Hari Hara Kumar, a uh, young professional, Jemar Division and IDM, and uh, Dr. Raju Thapa, uh, Technical Officer, Emergency Management, uh, CDC India. Uh, I thank all the uh, eminent speakers for providing us this opportunity uh, to learn and to gain from their experience and uh, from uh, their knowledge, uh, which they have shared with us. And I would also like to thank uh, Shri Taj Hassan, IPS uh, Executive Director and IDM uh, for his uh, um, guidance, for his support in organizing not only this uh, program, but uh, other as well. And uh, gratitude is also uh, due to the particip participant uh, who have joined uh, all three days all the, throughout the three, uh, three days they were with us. So uh, thank you uh, very much to all the participants for actively uh, participating in this uh, three-day online training program. And uh, in the end, uh, as I was, I was mentioning uh, earlier that uh, for e-certificate, uh, you need to be to get yourself registered on an IDM training portal and uh, you need to uh, enroll for this three-day online training program for uh, power sectors. And also please uh, keep, uh, it is also a mandatory that you have attend uh, all three days uh, above 60 percent your attendance should, should be more than 60 percent in each day and uh, this uh, feedback form is also available in an agent training portal once you will uh, fill your feedback form uh, then thereafter you will be able to uh, get a, a link to download your certificate in the online training portal itself so once again uh, thank you very much uh, to all uh, for joining us